Hey friends, it's that time again. My name is Kenny Jang, and this is the Church Online Podcast. Now today we've got my friend Justin Trapp, from, who hails from the great nation of Texas. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks Kenny for having me. It's good to be here. Um, first of all, it hit 105 degrees on my dashboard yesterday here in New Jersey. But from my understanding, that is no stranger to you to see that 100 plus uh, degrees this summer. Houston in the summer at 105 degrees is like walking into a hot steamy shower at 105 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. And I feel like this season is definitely hotter than, than, than normal. This is a very, very hot summer for us. But Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Um, hey, so... We brought Justin in because he's got some really, um, I think, almost controversial stuff. I mean, he's like going to put a finger in a lot of people's faces today listening because um, he is saying that there's three things that your church website is not doing today, but it should be doing. Right, Justin? Is that what you're you're uh, positing today for us? Yes, yes. Three, we'll be talking about three things that your church website should be doing, that it's currently not doing. And uh, I think if we can just tweak our efforts a little bit, you can get a lot better results. Um, before we get into that, why don't we share with the audience a little bit about your latest venture um, on in terms of helping churches to really get positioned for the digital ministry front in terms of engaging with people. Our church leaders just want to engage, engage, engage. They want people to actually sign up and actually get get involved with the church website, etc. You've got a tool that I think is very interesting um, and that should help a lot of church leaders take that first step. Yeah, so it's called Front Door, frontdoor.church. And Kenny, you and I have been talking about digital marketing and funnels for, for many years. And I feel like the church is just now coming around to like, hey, going, hey, like th this is really interesting. We could, we could leverage this at our church to reach people online, to connect with them, to get new leads. And a lot of times, once you, you're all in on that, that strategy, the tech stack required to pull this off is, I mean, let's just be honest, it's not simple, especially if you're at a smaller church with you know, a limited team or limited resources. Yeah that task becomes even greater. And so we, what we want to do with Front Door is give church leaders a very simple, scaled down solution to where you can uh, offer people free resources on your website or on your social media platforms, uh, have an opt-in page, and then send them automated follow-ups via email. That's what Front Door does. It's a three-step platform, uh, resources, the landing page, and then the automated follow-ups. Okay, awesome. So I think everyone bookmark that in your in your brain. Uh, because as we go through this, that that tool actually might become relevant. So, tell me a little bit about this this trifecta of things that the the major flaws, the catastrophe that people have created on their own church websites. You said there are three things that church websites aren't doing today. Let's start with one. What's one thing that church websites are not doing today, Justin? Well, uh, let me say this. When I think about churches and trying to leverage your website or your online profile to, to reach people, to connect with people digitally, I'm reminded of the, this sort of the story of the New Testament where the disciples have been fishing and they've been fishing all night and they haven't caught anything. And Jesus yelled out to them and said, hey, have you, have you caught anything? And they said, no. And he says, no. Throw your, you adjust your nets, right? Yeah. And so they, they, they move their nets to the other side and they have more fish than they can contain. I think... When I think about that story, I think about church leaders in this space for this particular conversation where we're doing all the things. We have you know, we have a website. We're doing streaming. We have our social media platforms. We just signed up for a TikTok, heaven forbid, right? We're doing paid Facebook ads. We have plan your visit that we just installed on the site. We're doing all the things. And I'm saying, hey, all, all these efforts are great. But if we can just tweak, we could just move our nets a little bit to some different waters we're in the right area. We're at, we're in the right space. Just tweak it a little bit. We're going to see an exponential return versus what we're currently mm -hmm. doing. And so that that's what I'm really that's really the crux of what I'm trying to get to today. And let me let me say this. Um, what late seventies, early eighties, a guy named James Angle created what he called yes. the Angle Scale. 
uh, it's a way of representing the journey from no knowledge of God to spiritual maturity. And churches were really good at measuring growth from salvation to disciple making, right? So someone makes a decision for, to follow Jesus. Then they start attending church regularly. Like that's the next step. Then they join a small group. They get baptized. I guess baptism would be maybe step two. Uh, then they give. Like if someone starts tithing regularly, like they're at level four, right? And then level five would be, uh, you know, they are making other disciples. What Engel said is that we're not really good at that pre-conversion uh, mm. growth. So I think the Engel scale, it's been – it's been uh, it changed a little bit throughout the years, throughout the decades. But I think Engel had like a negative 12, which is no awareness of a supreme being. I think that was what he originally stated. Then some awareness. So it goes all the way up to where they have a felt need. They, they see, a, 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 you know, they have a desire and they, they realize that they have a need for, for, for Jesus and the, and the gospel. And so I think the same is true, though, for people that you're trying to reach. So they have no awareness of your church. They have some awareness of your church. They are curious about your church. They are investigating. They are interested. And then they are ready to plan their visit. But I think a lot of times, and this goes to my first point, a lot of times we assume that everybody that comes to our church website is ready to attend. Like yeah. they hop on the website and they're looking to attend. And so what do we do? We have all of our information about our services and we have our guest page. And it's like, hey, plan your visit, plan your visit. Give us give us everything uh, about your children. Like we want to know your children's ages, their favorite colors, their favorite pizza topping. Like we ask for so much, right, <laughs> on that guest page, on these plan your visit modules. And I think what's important, and this goes to, I'm like being really long winded here, but the answer is this: we need to make our websites guest centric. We need to make the guest the focus of your website. Did you know, on average, that three times the amount of people will visit your church website in a month that versus the average weekly attendance at your church? So there's actually a lot of people coming to your church website. They're at all of those different stages, right? They have some awareness. Maybe they moved into the community and they drove by your church. You had a decent website. You were all on the sign, so they were going to look you up quickly or uh, late at night, laying in bed, they're... They uh, are looking for a new church. They've you know, just been disengaged with their current community. And so they're looking on Instagram, whatever the case may be. They have some awareness. They're curious. They're investigative. What we need to do is we need to make sure that our websites don't just have the, the new here page and that's it. You know, I did an exercise and I encourage everybody to do this. Google church and then just a random town in, you, uh, in the United States. <laughs> yes. Just anything. It could be Boise, Idaho. It could be yep. uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, the, and then look at the top five websites. I think you might be surprised that 95% of these church websites are not guest-centric. In fact, there was this large church. I do this exercise. I do it every, you know, every now and then. And there's this large church. I won't say what denomination they were. But they had literally uh, their prayer request wall on the homepage of their, their site. And you click on that. It was like one of those rotating sliders, which everybody hates. And you click on that, and then there's literally like a phone book of prayer requests, which I think is great for you to be able to pray. But it was very descriptive, though, of all of the prayer requests. And I thought, man, this has got to be breaking some sort of like HIPAA laws or something, right? All these <laughs> medical <laughs> disclosures. And But my point is this. Whether you, know, you think, hey, uh, you know, a larger church, they got their stuff together. Uh, surely they must be guest friendly on their website, but it's not true. Just Google church, random town USA. And what we need to do to make our guests, uh, our websites guest friendly is, is a few things. We need to, um, on your homepage, sort of acknowledge them, say what your church is about. You, you need to uh, make it easy for them to find the new here page. I'm not against the new here page. I'm not against like first time page, but, but make it easy. Uh, the staff page, I think, is important. That's a really high traffic page. Yeah. Uh, and then don't assume – I mean, Kenny, you've been in this business a long time. How many times? If you, if you got paid $100 for every time a pastor told you this, we'd all be rich, right? As you, They want, the, they want uh, the rotating slider, and they want to show all the events because they want people to know things are happening. Gosh, yeah. 
I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that phrase. And what I'm saying we need to do is scrap all of that and just say, hey, if someone came and they just barely heard of your church for the first time, what do you want to communicate to them? What do they want to know? They're, they might not be ready to attend a service. I, so sh- I think that second question is more important. It's not what do we want to communicate to them. It's what do yes. they want to know yes. about your church? Yeah. Well, because, again, we assume, we have this bad pra- habit of assuming everyone's ready to attend. Everyone wants to plan their visit. And plan your visit is not like the villain here, but that's like the fifth step in this process, not the first step, right? They're, they're, they're coming from all different walks of life and they have all different, you know, they're coming from all different seasons and they have felt needs. And so I think it's important that we don't assume everyone is ready to attend and that we minister and we reach out to those people and we connect with those people in, in, in where, wherever they're at. And that comes to my next point here is that we just need to meet them where they are. You know, not everyone wants to listen. I mean, pastors, be yeah. honest. Be honest. We, we have to be honest. Not everyone wants to watch an hour and a half stream. Not everyone wants to listen to a 45-minute sermon right out of the gate, right? Uh, it's the first time they've ever visited your website. They might not have time to listen to a 45-minute message, but they do want to find some critical information. They want to see what your church is all about. Uh, we, you know, we, we've got to add value to them, I think, be, and outside of just giving them a 45-minute sermon. We, we need to add value to them uh, outside of just publishing the stream. We, and there are ways that we can do that. And we're going to, I'm, I'm going to talk about that. So, you know, I'm, I mentioned this to you before, Kenny, you can, we can all look at our Google analytics. We can look at our church website stats and we can say, Hey, there's 724 people that, that visited our church website last, last month. The problem is we don't know. Anything Who are they? About, yeah. They, we don't know anything about them. We know they're a data point, but we don't know their story. We don't know were they recently divorced. We don't know did they just get married. We don't know if they're a retired couple. We don't. We know their browser. <laughs> we know if they're on the phone or a desktop, but that doesn't really help us. We don't know what season of life. We don't know who they are. We don't know if they're a parent, if they have kids. None of that. The cool thing is, is that you can find all of this out very easily. And how you can do this. Oh, yes. Is you can offer resources, resources they uh, perceive as valuable, as helpful, as practical. And, and, and for example, if let's say on your children's ministry page, and most every church has a children's ministry page, they have a youth ministry page, they have a senior citizens page, all different types of ministry pages, the kids' ministry page, you create a resource or you find a resource. Front door has this resource frontdoor.church, where it's five Bible stories to share with your kids. And you, you offer that as a free download for parents. So not only are they on your church website and they're looking at the children's ministry, trying to figure out the service times, they're trying to yeah. figure out what type of environments uh, you have for their kids. You know, when they check little Johnny into the nursery and little Susie in the kids' church, there's this, there's this helpful resource, five Bible stories to share with your kids this summer. You're like, oh, wow, that's, 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 that's helpful. I, I'd like to do that before my kids go back to school. We have three weeks left. Maybe we could squeeze all of this in, right? So you offer that to them. They give you their email address in exchange and you follow up with them. Now, here's here's what's amazing. Now you know a few things about them. No longer is it just a, an iPhone browser uh, or I, you know iPhone device and a, a Safari browser and one unique visitor. Now you know it, it's uh, her name's Alice. And so it's a mom. She has kids and she wants to share the gospel with her children. That's really critical. That's really important because now when we re-engage and connect with Alice uh, through automated emails and follow up or whether it be text message or you you have a phone call, whatever the case may be, you have some important data points and you can uh, send them very, send her very specific messaging based on how she came into your yeah, church absolutely. funnel. Absolutely. So, absolutely. so first, first thing that your site needs to be doing more of is actually being radically guest centric from their point of view, not from ours, the church. Number two is providing resources so that you're actually meeting their real needs, right? Instead of just saying, come to our building, come to our building, come to our building. I don't care what your needs are. 
you're just going to come to our building and somehow everything's going to work out. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to actually, again, be guest centric and then attend to their needs. What's the third thing that most church websites really aren't taking advantage of? Uh, installing automation. Yeah, you know, I sort of alluded oh, to this. That sounds mentioned. like now that sounds very intimidating, Justin. Like that sounds complicated. I need an IT department. Like what? What are we talking about here? Well, I think with well, with, I mean, one example. Give me one different. example of what should I be automating on my website? Well, for so if 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 Alice puts her email address and she wants this free resource, you know, with front door it's really easy. All you have we have automated or three template emails that are already in the queue ready to go. You could do this with any sort of CRM. It just the level of difficulty varies depending on the CRM. I think Mailchimp you can install automation. And so what happens is, is when they when they give you their email address, then it sends them a series of emails and you can say, hey, I want to send an email a day. I want to send an email every four days. I think the important thing to remember is that however they enter that connection, that digital connection with you, that digital relationship with you is how you should sort of uh, follow up with them through that original mm -hmm. context. So if it's a parent and she's interested on about children's ministry stuff, you should your first few messages to them should be about the children's ministry, highlighting your children's pastor, maybe the security check ins or if they wanted to save some time before they attend. Uh, you know, later in the email sequence, you can give them an opportunity to fill out some stuff and that saves them time. So they're not having to wait and the parents are 15 minutes late to worship the morning of their first time. But here's why it's so powerful. A, when you do it in an automated way, automation trumps the termination, right? It, it can happen in your sleep. You can be sending emails in your sleep. But also, I think the important thing here is that when you're following up through that original context, you're building trust. You're building trust before they ever visit your, your service. You're building that relationship. You're sharing your story. You are, you are adding value to them based on that original um, request that they had for that free resource. And when you do this, this is very different than somebody just showing up randomly and they don't know what to expect. They sort of are lost. I mean, we've all had those people, if you've ever been a greeter or an usher at your church or work for the lobby where these people come in 20 minutes late and they're like deer in the headlights look and they just don't know where to go and they're confused and they're trying, you know, got, they got four kids all going to four different, you know, environments. That's very different than someone who has requested a children's resource, you followed up with them with three or four emails over a few week period. Now they know a lot about your church. They know a lot about your children's ministry leaders, what to expect, the environments for little G Johnny and little Susie. That's very different. You can build trust. You can add value to them all before they ever attend. And you know what? Maybe they're not ready to attend. But because you've added value, because you've built trust, you're moving them from some awareness to curious to interested, and then eventually to that, they're ready to plan the visit. Absolutely, absolutely. I love that, um, all those sentiments. Now, I will I will add to that, uh, I will underscore highlight, automation is something that seems intimidating, but you gotta take the first step and try with something. As Justin, you said, automation trumps determination. Um, we want to actually, <laughs> be consistent in our follow-ups, but sometimes juggling all the different things, especially on the digital front, is hard to keep track of. And this is where this is where automation allows you to scale personal relationships with technology. Yeah. Now can I go can I go back to the original point? I forgot to say something about making your website guest centric. Yeah. Uh, if you go I I said, hey, do this exercise. Google church and then any town USA. I also did another exercise on the about us page, or excuse me, like the new here page. If you're new here and what do you want to know about our church? I did a command F on Apple. So command F and I would do a search for us or our or we and you, dozens of we's and dozens of ours and dozens of us on that page. And I think we have to put ourselves in the shoes of people that don't really, they've never heard of your church before. Right. They, we have to talk to them more about their needs and talk to them with our with our messaging more about where they're at than just talking about us all the time. I think that's important. So maybe maybe do an audit on your website and just just do a command F and, and type us or we 
or our, and just see how many times you're actually referencing those words. And you'd be surprised. We just tend, as humans, we tend to think about ourselves more than we think about others. We tend to talk about ourselves more than we talk about others. And so I think it's important that we sort of reverse that and try to talk more about the guests, acknowledge the guests, talk to the guest more than we're just talking about ourselves. So Absolutely. sorry to, sorry to just, back we, up. Our team just recently did a story brand audit on a church website. It was a rapid audit and uh, we counted 37 we's on the homepage and two you's. And one of them was the phrase, Jesus loves you which wow. I know that's an important phrase and concept, but that is yes. a little bit of a throwaway for someone who's just trying to discover Christianity and your church, et cetera. Um, so it kind of doesn't even count. And so it was one to 37 and it just made it so clear that you are, you're trying to be the hero. You're not trying to make the person the hero and you're trying to really, um, if you're trying to demonstrate empathy and relevance, uh, you got to flip the script in that manner. So that, that's a good flag. Well, Justin, yeah. thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I think that is actually three good discussion points to have. And I would even say I would challenge you to ask that question uh, for any other staff members that are not communicators, maybe, to go to your own website and say, hey, are we being guest centric here? What's one suggestion that we actually might be guest centric for your ministry front that you deal with, right, for a different staff member volunteer? Second one is, um, in, in that context, what are the actual needs of the people that you regularly minister to in that ministry department? Um, and third is then brainstorming. Is there something that we can actually introduce in terms of a communication stream that we can automate over time to help attend to those needs that is really guest centric, right? And so I think that that is a practical exercise that we've seen work in a lot of different um, environments. And I, I, I highly recommend that you you take that um, first step uh, to trying to turn this thing around. Uh, Justin, as we leave here today, can you just share with us some of your digits? What is the best place to learn about um, Front Door, your, that new uh, tool that you've been able to release and make available to churches to help uh, accommodate for some of these new strategies? Uh, and then second, if someone wants to follow up with you uh, directly, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, so you want to check out frontdoor.church, we just launched it about six months ago, and I think it's going to be really, really helpful. One of the one of the biggest hurdles, Kenny, when I talk to other church leaders and church communications people, is installing a system like this to reach people and connect with them in, in a sort of a slightly different way than what we've previously imagined. One of the biggest hurdles is really that resources aspect, like, hey, I want to add resources. We want to be helpful. Uh, we want to have the children's Bible story resource mm -hmm. on the kids page. We want to have the the prayer resource on one of our pages. We want to have uh, maybe a, a family activity guide for people in the community. Those are all things that can add value to people visiting your website. But that seems like a lot of work. And where do we start? And so at Front Door, we have over 40 of those resources that are completely white labeled don't have our front door branding and you can put them on your church website and they add a lot of value. One of my favorite ones that we just finished is, uh, should I get baptized? This is mm. actually great for an, an internal campaign where your church can mention it from the platform. Hey, we have a free resource. It's called should, should you get back? You know, should you get baptized? Maybe you've had questions and send them to the website. Once they opt into that, guess what? We send them an automated, uh, sequence of emails about baptism 101 and then and then you you know what we're where we're heading right the last email invites them to get baptized try that campaign if your baptized uh, baptisms do not double after installing that campaign and being consistent with it for 90 days let me know i'll give you your money back but th i think that's one of the powerful things about front door is that that resource library that really enables churches to meet people where they are at even before they're ready to attend the service. And so that's frontdoor.church. And then also, if you want to just connect with me and give me a shout, say, Justin, I hated this podcast episode, or I thought you were terribly wrong, or you just had a question about church ministry stuff, uh, at Justin Trapp on Twitter. That's two Ps. I'm an old man. I'm almost 40, so Twitter is Twitter's my game. Twitter is it, um, regardless of ownership of the platform. So. Thank you, Justin, for being with us today. Um, 
if you guys are listening here today and trying to um, ask some real good questions and you're a little bit stuck, do me a favor. Reach out to me at Kenny at Church Tech Today and let me know what you're stuck on. And we might be able to bring Justin back or, you know, um, toss around that question here in, in a mailbag session coming up here on the Church Online Podcast. I'm Kenny Jang for Church Tech Today. We'll see you here next time for the next episode. And in the meantime, remember, be social. Stay social.